Our scripture reading this morning comes out of Ephesians chapter six, starting with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the ruler, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is God's word for us today. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Memorial Weekend. Uh, Hey, uh, Miranda led us in worship today. She has been our worship leader at Ignite, our campus ministry, and an intern here at LaCroix. This was her first weekend to fly solo, and I thought she just did a great job. Would you encourage her? Yeah. I, I just love to see young, gifted leaders be given an opportunity to, to soar, and she certainly is. So, hey, let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Open our eyes, the eyes of our heart to see the unseen, to be aware of realities beyond our senses and the urgency of the moment. Awaken us, O oh God. We pray in your name, in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, So two weeks ago, I was uh, wrapping up this message that I'm um, giving today. I I went home because sometimes I have to get out of my office to concentrate. So I was at home, and I was at my kitchen table, and I was looking out my backyard. And it was one of those beautiful, gorgeous days we had recently. The temperatures were in the 70s, and it was sunny. You know, what, what did we get? About how many of those a year? Maybe three or four? Now it's hot and humid, it will be forever. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm sitting there, it's beautiful outside, my yard just been cut, the flowers, we had a lot of flowers blooming at the time, I got my garden planted, it looked great, my backyard looked really good, okay? And everything was just real, birds were chirping, I mean, you know, kind of a Norman Rockwell moment. And, and, and it was so surreal because here I'm writing this message, reading this passage about spiritual war. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, everything seems so good. <laughs> everything seems so peaceful and quiet. And yet, and yet, there's this other reality. As we've already mentioned, Memorial Day, you know, um, we forget sometimes, you know, we're at war as a nation have been for 18 years. Longest running war in American history. We have troops in Afghanistan. And you know, most of the time, we kind of forget that, let's be, be honest. It doesn't affect you and I a whole lot. Um, and the reality is, is that there's this daily struggle, this battle for your soul and for the soul of every human being. And one of the greatest dangers is that we were tricked into thinking it's, it's peacetime. When in fact, spiritually speaking, it's not. It's not. I want to look at a, a remarkable passage in Ephesians Um, It's from chapter 6. You heard it uh, read from earlier. And here Paul talks about the need to be strong and putting on the full armor of God. Being fully armored. It's like, why? Because there's this spiritual struggle going on, friends. We forget. And we don't have eyes to see it often. 
Um, and, and, he, and he opens our eyes to the realities of um, a spiritual enemy that we have. In this series um, the, that we're calling The Truth About Lies, we, we're seeing that, that the tactics of this, of this enemy are not, not the kind of horror show stuff and the, the real scary kind of stuff that we often assim- associate with demons. More has to do with truth and lies and deception and falsehood. And so our eyes have to be open to this, so we're, we continue this series. Now, as we talk a, a little bit about the devil today, we remember what C.S. Lewis wrote when he wrote his great, uh, I mean, a, a fascinating book, Screw Tape Letters. If you haven't read it, read it. I'm gonna quote from it next week, okay? Um, when he opened the preface, he says, um, he says there's two equal and opposite errors when it comes to the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and one is to uh, have an excessive interest in them. And the devil's like both of them. They would take, he says, a, a magician or a materialist any day. What an advantage the enemy of our soul would have if, if we just simply don't believe he exists. Or if we're giving him way too much attention. But the scriptures talk about this reality, and, and here we see it. Um, in, in verse 13, he says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Um, and then going on in another passage, Paul drives this home in 2 Timothy. He, he writes to Timothy, he says, you, my son, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus. Why? He says, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer in this language. is really all throughout the New Testament, and sometimes we can just kind of gloss over it. And we get very comfortable and forget that we're in a, a very real struggle. The struggle is real. And it's um, the highest stakes of any struggle there is. So I want to look at this passage in Ephesians 6 um, as we continue this series. And I want to see some of the things Paul says. First of all, he tells us to recognize the real enemy. I'm going to skip down to, uh, to verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. <clears throat> So he's very clear here that, that he wants us to know and understand that we're not battling people. We're not war with, at war with people. I think sometimes the church forgets this. When we were using the language of uh, culture wars, I think it got a little out of, out of focus that, that somehow we were, you know, we were against people and that, that we were in some kind of struggle against people. No, it's not people. Now, I get it. People are the ones that we see. It's real easy because, you know, they're saying things or doing things that really bother us. But, Paul, but he's saying it's, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Take the hot button issue of abortion, which is really in the news big time right now. As a couple states have uh, made stricter laws, including our own. And um, I, I've been reading about this and I've read some of the most outlandish statements Defending what I think is the indefensible. It's real easy, you see, for me to get really angry at those folks who said that. But I have to remember and expect secular people are going to talk like secular people. They're going to believe like secular people. They're going to live like secular people. Just like we did before we came to know Christ. And so our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not human beings. We have to see the source of the spiritual struggle. And so he goes on to say, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now make no mistake, what he's talking about here is a very real spiritual presence in our world. Uh, It's the demonic. Uh, This is not, he's not talking about political, human political structures here as some modern commentators would like to see it. No, he talks about evil, he says spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And the Bible tells us that these are realities. And and let's just first off admit that we have, um, maybe we have a little bit of hesitance to believe this. Maybe because it seems just a little weird. You know, to think that there are demons we can't even see with our eyes and they're out there doing things. Um, but the writers of Scripture are pretty clear about their presence, reality, and Jesus 
even spoke to demons, cast them out, spoke often to the rurality. Now, again, one opposite error would be to get so fixated on that that all you see is a demon behind every bush, and that's not healthy. But nor is it healthy to disbelieve in what the Scriptures teach us here. i never forget when I was in seminary, Bob Tuttle, uh, my, my mentor, my professor, uh, was teaching a class, and, and he came into class angry. And you know, he's been here many times this year. If you know Bob, he's kind of a character, you know, sort of, to say it, to say it lightly. Uh, and he came into class one day, he said, I'm mad. So I think he said it in a way that I probably couldn't quote him here. Um, but but he's, <clears throat> anyway, he said, I'm really mad. And, I, and we said, oh, what's going on? He said, my son, I think his son was 10 years old at the time, came home yesterday and a teacher ridiculed him because he said he believed in angels. He says, what, what's the problem with be, believing in stuff? Do we only, have to, do we only believe in stuff that, that concerns height, width, depth, time, and motion? Is the only stuff that we can sense with our senses, is that the only stuff that's real? The reality is that there's this, there's this reality beyond our senses. Um, we, this room is filled with radio waves. This room is filled with cell phone uh, signals. We know that scientifically. The scriptures say that uh, this world is also filled um, with another evil presence. Now, they're less than God's. God is greater. In fact, Jesus has defeated them on the cross. They're a defeated foe. In fact, that's why they're so angry. We just have to deal with them until Jesus comes back. But the, ba the, the battles are fought, but the war is won. Hear that clearly. Uh, but there is this other dimension. And they prefer hiddenness. They prefer to just kind of be out of sight, out of mind. Because their tact is to be cunning convince you they don't exist it's a cosmic intelligence he says in the air in the atmosphere now when he says in the heavens he's not talking about when we think of heaven we think of heaven is somewhere way out there New, in the first century people thought of the heavens um, as as first off the air that we breathe the very atmosphere around us that that's that's the first heaven and that's why, so when Jesus says, pray our Father who art in heaven, he's not praying, to, pray to some God who's way off in some distant place. No, who's, who's so close, he's in the air that you breathe. He's closer to you than your next breath. That's the reality of the heavens. Um, and, and so, there's this reality in the, in, in the world. And sometimes you can sense it. You can see it, it they, they get what, these, these forces will get what's called a stronghold. They'll get certain places where they've been welcomed in and they kind of establish a stronghold there. I know some of you think it's far-fetched, but it's, it's, it's what the scriptures teach. And sometimes you, you can sense it in entire communities. And unless it's, it's defeated in prayer, it kind of stays around. There's a fascinating book written about Hollywood in the 1920s. And, and it describes the culture and it describes kind of the mores and this the way that people thought and believed. And it sounds like Hollywood today. I mean, infatuation with celebrities and, and outward appearance and dress and looks and people getting married and divorced quickly and, and uh, immorality and all the kind of stuff that you, you sort of think of when you think, when you think of Hollywood. And it's like all of the actors and actresses and directors and, and producers, they've all died. They're not even around, but the same spirit permeates. I'm a big World War II buff, and I've read a lot about that and the rise of, uh, uh, of Nazism in Germany. And people who've described Germany in the 1930s have, have used this kind of language. They said it was like something irrational was let loose. Even Secular writers who would not claim any Christian faith said it was like there was a darkness that descended upon the country. Friends, where does that come from? Paul tells us here that there are these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, we don't get spooked by this, but we should get moved to action. And we'll see in just a second what that is. So first of all, recognize the real enemy is not people. It's these spiritual forces of darkness. And then I think also Paul wants us to understand their tactics. Listen to what he says in 11, in verse 11 here. 
He says, um, he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Um, and, and, and so what is, what is this, this schemes? Uh, the scheme is, is sort of a, a plan that is sneaky and cunning. And he's saying, I want you to be aware. There's another, there's another uh, place in Paul, one of Paul's letters where he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. I want you to be aware. Because if, if we really have an enemy, we, we kind of need to know how that enemy works and how he functions. And so this, several times he says this here. So we have to understand the, the, the enemy's tactics. And what is it? Well, as we're trying to say in this series, it's, it's about truth and error, lies, deception, falsehood. Go back to, to this verse and what Jesus said when he spoke about the, the devil. He said he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. That's the, the devil, it's the father of lies. Um, and so that's the main tactic that he uses, deception. I like how John Mark Comer puts it. Um, he's a pastor out in, in Portland. And I, and I love this phrase because I think it, it, it's, it's really helpful. And it helps us in one sentence see the kind of three enemies that we struggle with, okay? Let's put this up, up on the screen. Uh, that the devil's strategy is this, deceptive ideas that play to disorder desires that are normalized in a sinful society. Now hold that up there for a second. The Bible says we have three great enemies, the, 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 the world, the flesh, the devil. Brett talked about the flesh a couple weeks ago and how we have these disordered desires. These, we desire the wrong kinds of things inside of us. But deceptive ideas, that's, that's the demonic, that play to disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society. Hey, everybody else is doing it, everybody else is for it, so it must be okay, right? that that's his strategy. Um, and, and so we have to be aware of the deception. And our eyes have to be open to the deception. And the problem is we live in an era, and when it comes to the subject of deception, we live in an era that has increasingly doesn't believe in truth. In fact, back in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary picked uh, a word of the year. They, they pick a word of the year every year. They, they base it on how much that word usage has gone up during that year. They kind of chart these things and, and how much they appear on, on, on the web and so forth. And, and, they, and they picked the word of the year for 2016 was post-truth. Hyphenated word. All right? I don't think that counts, but it counts. Okay, they said it counted. So they must, they're a lot smarter than me at Oxford Dictionary. Um, and, and they said this, this, is, this was the word for 2016 that we increasingly live in a post-truth society. We don't really believe in absolute truth. We believe it's relative. And so you hear people say, well, that's your truth. This is my truth. Right? Have you ever heard that said? Yeah. Um, which means kind of whatever you want it to be, to be that's what, what truth is. Um, and, and so dealing with deception, see, right there, is a tactic. Get them to not believe. Go, read screw tape letters. Read. You need to read screw tape letters, okay? You'll, you'll love it. You'll thank me for it later, okay? It's a good book. Um, but anyway, it's a tactic. It's interesting. One, I, I heard some talk about this recently in a podcast, and it was kind of fascinating. Have you ever heard of asymmetrical warfare? It's fascinating stuff. Um, uh, sometimes it's called dirty warp. And it's, you, normally when we think of war, we think of, you know, uh, bullets flying, bombs dropping, you know, things uh, exploding. Um, but asymmetrical warfare is not, is, doesn't use weapons like that. And, and, and they say it's being waged all across, especially across the, the internet. It's, it's dirty war. It's, it's spreading lies and disinformation and rumors and falsehoods. In fact, you know, it's highly unlikely that we as a country anytime soon would ever be invaded by a foreign army and that they would take our territory. But what is the goal of asymmetrical warfare is to control the narrative. Control the narrative, control what people are saying, and then you can kind of get control of folks. In fact, there are these things I learned called troll farms. You ever heard of a troll farm? 
Different, com- different countries have these troll farms. And they're organi- a troll farm is an organization whose employees or members attempt to create conflict and disruption in an online community by posting deliberately inflammatory or provocative comments. Have you seen any of those lately? And so what they get in, they, they find where differences exist in a culture like our own, and they, they create these false accounts, and they, they spread all of these kinds of provocative statements, what, to stir it up even more, to get people even more angry because what? United we stand, divided we, we fall. Now that's on the, the geopolitical front, okay? But I thought, wow, that sort of sounds like the tactics the enemy is using way before the web. Spread lies, spread disinformation. In fact, the devil has been doing a disinformation campaign for a long time, spreading lies about God, spreading lies about us and who we are and God's love for us, spreading lies about you in your own mind. And so we need to, we need to wise up to his tactics and call out that disinformation when we hear it in our own head, when we hear it spoken. So Paul is telling us in this passage, recognize the real enemy, it's not people. Um, understand the enemy's tactics, and then take your stand. Take your stand. Um, Let's look at this. Let's go back to the first verse. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. I love that verse. And notice, this is one of the in Christ sayings. If you were with us during the season of Lent, we did a series called Before and After, and we looked at some of the in Christ sayings. And at the time, I said there's 172 of them, or a variation in Christ. This is a variation of that in the Lord. And so what, what is he saying there? Be strong, not in yourself. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Be strong in the Lord, and you'll be strong, and you'll stand. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. It's up to us leaning on God's power. So he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then he goes through, and some think that when Paul was, was arrested and, and brought to trial and, and had many guards next to him, that he kind of looked at the, the, uh, uh, the uniform of the Roman soldiers. And, and, he, and he got it. It was kind of clearly in his mind. And he, and he starts picking pieces of the Roman uh, military uniform, and he starts drawing analogies to each of them. Uh, now, I don't have time today to go through the full armor of God. I don't have time to talk about the breastplate of righteousness or the helmet of salvation or the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, or, or uh, the, our feet shed, uh, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Though you can read more about that. That's a message for another day. Um, but I do want to look at the first thing, and I think it's telling. What's the very first thing that he says to put on? Stand firm, then for, therefore, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Belt of truth. Why? What's the enemy's tactic? Lies. He's the father of lies. It's his native language. So what do we need to combat that? We need truth. And it's like that holds everything else. You know, the belt, it holds everything up, right? If I didn't have my belt on right now, my pants could fall down. It would be very embarrassing for me and and, and, uh, uh, traumatizing for you, okay? Uh, And so we don't want that to happen. So I got this belt on, right? So so what he's saying is that truth holds it all together. The reality, why does Christianity work, if I could say it so crassly? Because it's true. There really was this man, Jesus, who lived about 2,000 years ago, who lived who died on the cross and who rose again. This really happened. And there's power in it because it's true. And so he says, make sure that you have truth. Now I've said if the, if the enemy's um, tactic is to spread falsehood, then that means we need to know the truth. Truth is so very important. Again, this becomes a bit of a problem for us because we're swimming against the tide because um, we come out of a culture, and I'll talk more about culture next week. The other enemy that we face, the world. We come out of a world that doesn't um, believe in, in truth. But very simply, what is truth? Didn't Pilate ask that question when Jesus was in front of him before trial? You know, Jesus didn't answer him. He just looked him in the eye. You know why? Because truth was looking Pilate in the eye. Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. Um, Truth. Truth is what aligns with reality. Jesus is the greatest reality about God. 
And in just a very practical sense, daily, truth is what aligns with reality. The truth is this is Memorial Day weekend. Okay? Are you like me? Do you sometimes call it Labor Day weekend and Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend? Am I the only one that does that? Now, I can't say it's old, old age because I've been doing that for like 30 years, you know. I get them mixed up, you know. I, I just do. But the truth is, this is Memorial Day weekend. The truth is, it's hot and humid outside, right? If I came in here and I said, oh my gosh, these sub-zero temperatures are really getting to me. You would rightly look at your neighbor sitting next to you and says, is he Okay. I mean, you know, Pastor Ron, you probably ask those questions anyway. Uh, but if I said that, you'd really be worried, right? Because, like, Ron isn't in touch with reality. The truth is it's hot and humid outside. The truth is the St. Louis Blues are going to the Stanley Cup Finals. Yes. <laughs> First time I could say that in my life since I was 10 years old. So there you go. Awesome. Go Blues. Um, <laughs> that has nothing to do with Ephesians 6, by the way. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever. Um, so truth is what aligns with reality. In fact, it, it, truth is so very important that, that um, when God sent a Savior to save the world, what was one of his primary, um, one, one of the primary ways he functioned in his ministry? He was a teacher. He was called teacher. What do teachers do? Teachers teach us the truth. And the very fact that he was a teacher meant that we need to be taught, that we believe things that aren't false and we need to, to hear the correct thing. We need to be, that's so, so Jesus was a teacher, so important. In fact, he said something um, that is, is uh, life-changing. In fact, I bet you know this phrase. I bet you can complete it for me. You will know the truth and the truth will, very good, excellent. Yeah, the truth will set you free. I read recently that mental health can be described as a dedication to reality at all costs. That if you want to get mentally well, then you need to really know the reality about yourself. The fact is, we have things that we're not aware of. So he's not very self-aware, right? All of us have big chunks of our life where we're not self-aware, and that can lead to problems. Pathology has been described as the inability to accept reality. Your very mental health is, is dependent upon you getting in touch with the truth about yourself. And when you're not in touch with the truth about yourself, what? We're in, we're in trouble. So truth is so, so very important. Jim Collins is an author who has written a number of books uh, for the business community. And, and he says that um, Owners of businesses and those who run companies need to be in touch with the facts. He calls them, in fact, he calls them the brutal facts. You know, if you're running a company, you need to know how sales really are, not what maybe people are telling you. You need to know what the real story is. You need to know the brutal facts if you, if you expect to help your company succeed, okay? So in business and in our mental health and everything, we need to know the truth. We need to what? To be in touch with reality. And he says, buckle around yourself the belt of truth because it holds everything else up. The truth will set us free. And then, again, there, he goes through the other elements of the um, armor of God. I don't have time to go through that, but I'll get to the end because this is so important. In verse 18, he says, and pray. And pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. See the urgency there? Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Paul believed that we should pray first. Sometimes we pray as a last resort. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if that's how sometimes you pray. It's like, you know, I did this, I consulted that, I tried this, I did this, I tried all these other things, I guess I'll pray. Now, what if you when you went to work tomorrow, if you go to work tomorrow, oh no, tomorrow you won't, never mind. If you're having trouble with the barbecue tomorrow, <laughs> pray first. Everybody else will appreciate it. No, you go to work Tuesday, what? Pray first. When you get up in the morning, pray first. Pray at the end of the day. I love what Matthew Henry said. I heard this quote recently, I love this. He says, if you'll pray at the beginning of the day and if you'll pray to end your day, you will pray throughout the day. Pray. Pray first. 
Pray on all occasions. Paul's strategy here, we talked about the devil's strategy. Paul's strategy, pray for everyone and everything on all occasions. Do you sense the urgency there? In our days, we, we don't need, what, what's not gonna change this world is a nominal faith. A lukewarm kind of nominal Christianity. It's not gonna make it. What's gonna make it is, a, is people who are awake spiritually. He says, be alert. So easy to fall asleep, isn't it? Spiritually. He says, be alert, be awake. We need people who are awake spiritually and who are praying for what? For all God's people. I love it. He says, with this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray for one another here. Pray for the person to your right, to your left. Pray for those in your family. Pray for those you work with. Pray for those that you disagree with. Pray for those, pray for your neighbors. Pray. And uh, I'll get to the content of that in just a second. Guys, what happens when we are people of prayer? Prayer, the very, the very you know, um, gesture of it, if we kneel, is a humbling thing. To pray is to submit yourself to God. That's why James says this. Listen to the wisdom that James gives us here. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So you resist the devil. And how you do that, you pray. You draw near to God. He draws near to you. Um, and so take your stand, and you take your stand by praying. Three times he says here to stand. Why? Because the danger is always present that we would fall that we would fall in our relationship with God. And we can have a debate about whether a person can lose their salvation or not, but we know that people can fall in their relationship with God. They can fall in their active discipleship and become nominal and become lukewarm and become inactive in their faith. And so three different times in this passage, she says, stand. Pray that you would stand. Um, the reality is living for God in our day, I think is harder and I think it's only going to get harder. And what is needed is an urgency and a, and a praying spirit. And, and so I would invite you, perhaps go home and read the rest of Ephesians because Paul in this letter gives us several great things that you say, well, what do I pray for? Go back to Ephesians, just pray the prayers that are found in chapters one and three. These are great prayers. Chapter one, he says, uh, he says I haven't stopped giving thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers says, I keep asking that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. There's something to pray about. Pray that people in your world, your loved ones, people in this church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, may be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation that they may know Jesus better. Sometimes when I'm praying for you guys, I pray that you would know Jesus better, that you would know his great love. He says, and the inheritance that we have and, the, and his incomparably great power for us. Then go over to, to Ephesians 3. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. Maybe you know, need some, know some folks who need to be strengthened with power, spiritual power. Pray. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. Pray for your kids, your grandkids. Pray for your parents. What, that they would know the love of Christ. Pray. It's the greatest, it's the greatest resource we have. And it is a power that makes the gates of hell shudder. That's why all of hell works against Christians praying. You start getting a serious com commitment to prayer and you watch it how everything is gonna be thrown against you, how everything is gonna come at you. Because hell shudders at the thought of God's people submitted to him, bowing and praying. If we do that, we might see an awakening. We need a great awakening. We pray every January for that. Let's not forget that through the year. Pray that God would bring an awakening, awaken people to their need, and, and win people who are held captive by the darkness of the enemy, just like we once were held captive by the darkness of the enemy. And their eyes may be opened, that we may know the love of Christ. So I invite you to pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we, um, 
We need our eyes open. We need to be awakened spiritually. Forgive us when we have slumbered, when we have slept, when we have not kept watch. Just like your disciples who fell asleep in the garden and you said, couldn't you keep watch for one hour? We've been those disciples. Jesus, help us to know the power that we have in prayer and to exercise it. To unashamedly pray on all occasions for everything, for all of God's people. So that the name of Jesus may be highly esteemed in our midst. And that we might stand. The Lord, we pray these things. And I pray, give us the spirit of prayer. Make us a people of prayer. So that when the evil day comes, we can stand. But we pray in the name of Jesus, who intercedes and prays all times for us. Amen.